Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's public webinar with TPC entitled Understanding the Refrigeration Cycle as an HVAC Technician. My name is Ryan Smith, and I am joined today by our expert instructor, Bill Smith, or William Smith. And uh, he's going to walk through the refrigeration cycle today and how we can use our understanding of the different pieces of that refrigeration cycle in understanding uh, how to figure out what might be wrong in an HVAC sy system and how to troubleshoot it. So in today's session, um, we're going to spend the hour together uh, spending time about this topic. Now, before I give it over to Bill, I would like to go over just a couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, the first thing is that this webinar is being recorded and the video recording of this webinar will be made available to you, you uh, on our website about two or three business days after this session is over. So be on the lookout for that. And then also, this webinar is live right now. So because of that, let's feel free to use the Q&A feature on today's webinar. You should see along the toolbar, um, you have a few things, including Q&A. Uh, click the Q&A button, you'll see a window that pops up and you can type your question and that question will come to us and we'll be able to answer your question that way. Try to avoid using the chat window for that purpose uh, so we'll be able to actually take the questions and prioritize them. Uh, also, uh, about two to three business days after this webinar is over, you'll see the PDF of these slides as well. So be on the lookout for that. And you don't necessarily have to take screenshots of what you're seeing if you don't want to. And then finally, because today's session is live, I would like to utilize that by getting to know a little bit more about our audience who is here and by asking two very quick poll questions to just gauge your thoughts and experience on the topic of troubleshooting air conditioning systems. So we're gonna launch a little poll to you with two questions. And that poll should be appearing right now on your screen. There's two questions and you can just click your answer to each of these two questions and then submit the poll. The first question is, how comfortable are you in your ability to troubleshoot air conditioning systems? Again, it's, it's okay to be fully honest. That's why you're here, right? Are you very comfortable, somewhat comfortable, neutral on that, uh, somewhat uncomfortable? Are you quite uncomfortable, very uncomfortable in your ability to uh, troubleshoot an air conditioning system if you're sitting in front of one. And second, um, have you taken an instructor-led training uh, instructor -led training for air conditioning in the last five years? Would you say yes or no? And uh, Bill, obviously being one of our instructors in, in air conditioning, so I think it'll be really good for us to really know what the answer to that question is. So it uh, looks like the answers are evening out here. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Thank you so much for your answers. And then I'm gonna share the results in percentages with everyone here. So you should see a new window popping up with some of the results. As you might expect, because we have such a large crowd of people here today, the experience level is all across the map as we can see, uh, ranging from 11% of you who are very comfortable to 27, 22, 24, and 16% of you all across the map. Um, in different comfort levels. So because everyone here has different levels of experience and comfort level with air conditioning, this is the perfect opportunity to just have a little bit more learning. For people who are on the more comfortable side, this will be a good refresher for you and people, and also a way not to be too complacent in what you've been doing. And then for the people who are very uncomfortable, maybe new to the job, this is a really great little burst of information to get you started on your training journey. No, by no means is it a full training, but uh, uh, this is a good way to get started. And then secondly, this is a really cool thing to see. Have you taken an instructor-led training for air conditioning in the last five years? By far and away, the majority of you, 79% of you have not taken an, an official class in air conditioning in the last five years. So that'll be really good for Bill to know as we, as we get into <laughs> the topic coming up here that uh, in, we might see the importance of instructor-led training in this space, particularly hands-on training uh, that is offerable um, in that area. Obviously, on-the-job training will play a piece as well, so where that fits into the uh, puzzle. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing our results. So that window should disappear from your screen now. And so what you all should see now is our title slide that says, Understanding the Refrigeration Cycle as an HVAC Technician. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Bill. Thank you so much for being here, Bill. Thank you, Ryan. And welcome everybody to this webinar on air understanding the refrigeration cycle as an HVAC technician. The biggest grasp as far as air conditioning is understanding the fact that 
Ryan and I were just talking. I'm coming to you from Pennsylvania. It's 70 degrees outside. Feels nice and comfortable outside. By tomorrow morning, it's going to be 30 degrees. Does it feel cold outside? No, it's the absence of heat, the heat being taken out of the air that makes us feel uncomfortable. And that's the whole premises of air conditioning is the absence of heat, taking heat out of one place and moving it to someplace different. And if you're doing refrigeration, then you're taking heat, not out of the air, but out of a product, trying to get a product down to a comfortable temperature that's in a food grade range. So like refrigeration for um, meats and dairy products, probably like a 38 degree temperature range. And then your frozen products getting down to like a 10 to minus 10 degree temperature range. And if you've ever had the pleasure of being in a blast freezer where the temperature is minus 40 degrees, you definitely understand the theory of absence of heat. So the refrigeration cycle itself, four major components and how air conditioning works, superheat and subcooling and how to use and, and use them for system for troubleshooting. We're gonna to touch base a little bit about superheat and subcooling, but with a 45 minute presentation, it's not possible for us to go over everything in this presentation. This is just kind of giving you a general understanding. For some of these, it'll be a review, and for some, it'll be a general understanding of how the refrigeration cycle works, what the four major components are. The four major components, the first major component is going to be your evaporator, and your evaporator is there to go ahead and pick up the heat that you have in your conditioned space. So heat being transferred from the condition space into the refrigerant and causing the refrigerant to change state. So in the evaporator, we have what we call latent heat exchange. We're taking the heat that we're picking up from the air and causing our low pressure, low temperature liquid to start to boil off and become a low pressure, low temperature gas. When you have sensible heat, that'd be the example as I go out on tonight, and it's 70 degrees, I'll be in a t-shirt. But tomorrow morning, if I go out to shovel the sidewalk, I'll be layering up a little more because I will be able to sense a temperature difference. Now, as far as the changing from pressure liquid to a gas, that's what we're gonna call latent heat exchange. We're picking up heat, not for a change in temperature, but to change the state of our refrigerant that's cycling through our system. We start out in the evaporator, and we're gonna have it come in as a low pressure, low temperature liquid, picking up heat, causing it to change to a low pressure, low temperature gas. And as we continue through the cycle, we'll see we get to what we call a compressor. Now, the compressor wants to have low pressure, low temperature gas exclusively coming back. So the gas is going to be coming in as a low pressure, low temperature. And when you compress a gas, it causes the gas to rise up in pressure and when pressure goes up, temperature goes up. A good example I use for class is, can you compress a liquid? In the summertime, try jumping into a swimming pool, and I call it like a Superman plunge, straight out, you know, full body hitting, not just your feet, and going through the air, nothing's going to stop you. But when you hit that water, it's going to feel like a brick. Boom. And that's why we want to make sure we only have gas going in the compressor because the compressor wants to only compress gas. As it takes that gas and raises it up in pressure and temperature, we put it into another component called the condenser. Now, the condenser says heat is transferred from the refrigerant to the outside air. All the heat that we picked up in the evaporator is now being discharged out, or they call it rejected out, into the air outside, a place where it's unobjectionable. We don't want it. We don't want to be warm in our house, and we want to put the heat outside. If it's a 90 degree day outside, adding more heat to the outside is okay, as long as we get to 70 or 65 inside the house. And with refrigeration, we're just taking heat out of the product and lowering the product temperature down and then a condenser outside somewhere of the condition space, putting the heat out into the air. Once in a condenser then, as you see, it comes in as a gas, high pressure, high temperature gas, but it condenses. Again, condensing would be if we have reached 100% humidity outside and it starts to rain and we reach what we call a dew point or a saturation point. That's an example of condensing. So the condensor is a component that condenses our vapor or gas back into a liquid and gives off the heat. That's a latent heat exchange. 
So it's still going to go in as a high pressure and go out as a high pressure, but latent heat exchanging it, causing it to change into a liquid. And the process, when you walk outside in the summertime, hold your hand over top of your outdoor unit, you'll feel a lot of heat coming off your fan. All that heat is what's coming from inside your house and being transferred by the refrigerant outside to a place where it's uninjectionable. Now, once we have it as a high pressure liquid, we'd like to use that liquid over again. So the way we're gonna use that liquid over again is we're gonna come in what we call the expansion valve. The expansion valve takes that liquid as it's pushing through there and restricts the flow. So imagine you have a balloon, you blow up a balloon and then you start letting air out of the balloon. You're gonna have a much higher pressure inside the balloon then you are outside the balloon. It's pushing the air out. The pressure is pushing it and trying to equalize between the two. And as it's doing that, it's going to lower the pressure down. And that's what's happening in the expansion valve. We're slowing down the amount of liquid going through there and then opening up and letting it go to a larger opening so it reduces the pressure. So we've got our four major components, the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, and the expansion valve, and each one has a unique reason why it's there. The evaporator is there to pick up heat and cause the refrigerant to boil and change into a gas. The compressor pumps the vapor through the system and also changes it from a low pressure gas to a high pressure gas. We want it to be a high pressure gas when it reaches the condenser because at that point we want it the temperature of the refrigerant vapor higher than the surrounding air. So it gives off its heat. Heat always transfers from a high to a low, high pressure to low pressure or high temperature to low temperature. So we're using this process in these four major components. We're gonna make the evaporator colder than the surrounding air. So it wants to pick up heat and absorb it into the evaporator like a sponge. We're gonna take and have the condenser so we're gonna have the temperature higher than the surrounding air. So it wants to push the heat out away and cause the change of state back into a liquid. And again, taking that liquid and forcing it through an expansion valve. So it's a small little opening that's going to allow a certain amount of refrigerant to push through. And as it's put, it's gonna lower the pressure down into a low pressure liquid. And that's your four major components of the refrigeration cycle and split, as you see, a low pressure side and a high pressure side. So we're gonna have manifold gauges, which is like a stethoscope. We're gonna hook on to the high side and the low side, and we're gonna get a pressure. And we're gonna be able to take that pressure and read the, and see what pressure, there's normal operating pressure, we should be on the low side, normal operating pressure, we should be on the low side, and use that as a diagnostics tool. Now we're gonna take it a step further than that, we start talking about superheat and subcooling, and I'll explain that more in detail. Air conditioning, refrigeration, transfer heat to replace not wanted. The place makes little or no difference. And it also takes humidity out of the air. So when we are going ahead and we are removing and cooling the temperature down, we're causing the air moisture to saturate. And that's what we mean have anyone ever heard of talking about having a condensate pan underneath your evaporator? So if you're in a humid area, which Pennsylvania is a really humid area where I live, you will have a lot of moisture being coming out of your evaporator. So if you look at your pipe, you're usually gonna have a drain that comes off of your evaporator and a pan collects the water and then drains the outside. Take a look at that periodically. You should see moisture like pushing out the back end of that. And that's a good sign that the system is working properly. So taking humidity, heat out, and which makes us feel cool. There's no cold, as I mentioned, it's absence of heat. Cold is a comparison of two things. I have 85 degrees, is that cool? Compared to 100 degrees, it is. So it's not necessarily that 85 is cold or warm, it's just, it has uh, comfortable for most people, a degree of heat intensity that makes your human body feel comfortable. The human body is 98.5 degrees. The lower we get to that temperature outside, the more heat we're giving off and you start to feel uncomfortable. And anyone who's joining us from like Arizona, 
California, Las Vegas, you know that it's the opposite then. Your body temperature is 98.5. And if you're in 120 degrees temperature, 100 degrees temperature, then you don't feel very comfortable because your body's not expelling heat. You're actually picking up more heat and your body core temperature is starting to get too warm. So we become very popular people when it becomes a higher temperature outside. You know, you're, you're the savior. They want you there and, and uh, you are an important process, which is why when we had COVID, one thing that didn't get shut down is air conditioning, refrigeration technicians. We still were out there doing our thing in the line of fire. So taking the heat from the conditioned space, putting it in the refrigerant, and then taking the refrigerant outside and displacing the heat out away from the refrigerant. Refrigerant can be cooled with water cooled if you have chillers. We can use water then to cool the condenser water. So instead of displacing the heat to the air, we're going to displace the heat to the water. Water is a much better transfer of heat than air is. The density of water, if you have a pound of air and a pound of water next to each other, you have less space for a pound of water than you do for a pound of air. So think about it. If you're outside and it's 75 degrees outside, and you jumped into a swimming pool at 75 degrees, which would feel more comfortable for you? Being in a 75 degree air or being in a 75 degree water? The water is gonna make you feel much more uncomfortable because you're gonna be surrounded by more surface of pounds per water and you're going to feel the heat zapped out of your body faster, which is how hypothermia works. So the three states of matter, matter, solid, liquid, and gas. The temperature that that matter is determines what state it's gonna be. If you think about these as water, as an example, at 32 degrees, we call that the freezing point. At 212 degrees for standard atmospheric pressure, we call that the point at which it's going to boil. And that's what's happening. If you take that water and you start extracting heat out of it, you're gonna change it to a solid. If you add more heat to the solid, so ice, you're gonna start making it to become a liquid. And if you add even more heat, it's going to start to turn into a gas and expand in all directions. As you see, a solid exerts pressure just downward, one pressure pushing. A liquid takes the shape of the containers outward and downward, but a gas expands in all directions. The two states we're gonna have in our refrigeration cycle are liquid and gas, and we try to maintain them inside of our refrigeration cycle with our piping, with a suction line, a discharge line, and a liquid line, moving the refrigerant from one place to the other, but we wanna make sure it's sealed in there. We don't want any of the refrigerant leaking out. We use that same refrigerant over and over and over again. Can't specify it enough, the second law of thermodynamics. This is what makes air conditioning do what it does. It's the principle behind it. Taking heat from a place where it's unprojectionable and moving it to someplace else. So in a sense, you're not actually blowing cold air into your house when you're cooling in the summertime. You're actually taking heat out of your house that's what's making you feel comfortable, taking the heat out of your house. So airflow becomes a huge issue for air conditioning. We got to have enough air moving to get the heat to move to where we want to come into it, our evaporator and remove the heat out of our evaporator. So BTU, amount of heat required to raise temperature one pound of water. This is what we're going to use to rate our air conditioning system. How many BTs of heat energy can we remove in a one hour time? How much heat can we remove in a one hour time? So if you look at your unit and it says, I have a one ton unit, that would say that you can remove 12,000 BTUs in a one hour time. The pr problem is once you set it up that you're only removing 12,000 BTUs, let's say you build a sun deck and you say, oh, you know what? I got this air conditioning unit. Let's just go ahead and tap into that other unit. And we, but the problem is it's only sized and designed to take a certain amount of heat out in an hour's time. So you can, you can 
really bog them down and they won't cool anything down because you're trying to remove too much heat with a smaller unit. You need a larger unit when you get into that. So air conditioning is this right here. We're gonna remove BT's heat energy and cause the temperature to drop. So I'm looking for a 20 degree drop across the inlet to my outlet of my indoor coil. So if I have 75 degree air going in with my unit running, airflow and refrigeration cycle, I should see about 55 degree air coming out. And it's very important to make sure you have that return air going back into your unit. If you just strictly dumped in 55 degree air without removing any of the heat, you will not feel comfortable. And another thing, remember humidity, getting the humidity out of the air. So a 70 degree day, if you just run your unit long enough to get temperature down 70 degrees, but you don't run it long enough to get the humidity out of the air, you're still gonna be sitting there sweating. It's gonna be uncomfortable, very, very uncomfortable. So a ton of refrigeration, 2,000 pounds of ice is one ton. They put it at 32 degrees temperature, and they said it took 288,000 BTUs of heat energy to melt that in a 24-hour period. That's a big number, 288,000. So divide it by 24 and said this is actually 12,000 per hour. So if you buy a window air conditioner, you'll see it marked on there. It's 5,000, 6,000, 8,000, maybe 10,000 BTUs per hour. They size that off of square footage. So a 10 by 10 room, 5,000 BTU. And as you start to get larger, you're going to need more BTUs. So when you do a load calculation at your house, you're taking into account your square footage and you're also taking into account any heat losses or heat gain that you're going to have in your system. Sensible heat, as I mentioned, it is a change of temperature, change of temperature. I have sensible heat in my metering device and I have sensible heat in my compressor. Compressor is changing the gas from a low pressure gas to a high pressure gas, the state of it still staying as a gas. In my metering device, I'm taking a high pressure or temperature liquid and lowering the temperature down to a low pressure, low temperature liquid. But in my compressor and in my evaporator, we're doing latent heat exchange. We're taking a low pressure liquid in the evaporator and adding enough heat to it to cause it to change into a low pressure vapor. And in the condenser, we're taking all that heat that we picked up and taking it as a vapor and taking all the heat out of it to condense it back into a liquid. So we can reuse that refrigerant over and over and over again. So it's very important to make sure you have a leak-free system. And once you put the refrigerant in there, you wanna make sure you're using it the same refrigerant continuously. Now, I mentioned pressure a little bit ago. Atmospheric pressure is pounds per square inch of pressure pushing down. So you have blocks of air pushing down against you. The pressure inside of a container is measured using what we call a PSIG gauge. That's our manifold gauge set. So we put it on there and what we're doing is we call zero atmospheric pressure. Why is zero atmospheric pressure? Because we're saying that we're gonna start at a atmospheric pressure and then continue to go forward from there. So the higher you go in elevation, the lower the atmospheric starting point is going to be. It's opposite of what you would think. So here we see at sea level, we see 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch atmospheric pushing down on us. And we have a block of air and all these blocks building up square inch and more pressure pushing down. And as we go above to 18,000 feet, we see that it is less atmosphere pushing down on us because we don't have as much air. You heard the word thinner air? That's what they're referring to. We don't have as much air pushing down against us. So if anyone's joining us from Denver, Colorado, we know that Denver, Colorado is called the Mile High City. It's 5,280 feet above sea level. In Pennsylvania, we were always taught Atmospheric pressure is 14.7, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not always the case. As you see, 0.49 PSI 
per 1,000 feet of elevation. We decrease by that amount. So every time you go up 1,000 feet, you have less atmospheric pressure pushing down on you. Why is it harder to breathe? There's less air surrounding you. And that's why if you go to Denver and try to climb a set of stairs, you might have a harder time if you are someone who lives in New York City and fly to Denver and try to exercise in Denver, there's gonna be a distinct difference there. So the 14.696, the 12.1 is our standard atmospheric pressure. So that's what the starting point is. But on a gauge, we subtract that off and say, let's not start at 14.696, let's call atmospheric pressure zero. So your zero PSIG in New York City would be equivalent to 14,696, but in Denver, Colorado, it'd be 12.1. So what's important then is to make sure that you are recalibrating your gauges then to make sure that you are starting at zero with the atmosphere you have in your area. Some of your newer digital gauges have a button on there, you just click a button, and it automatically calibrates it for you to whatever atmosphere you're starting out at. Old school, we have a needle and we have to take the, the dial and move the needle back to zero when there's no pressure on the gauge and starting out at zero would be our atmospheric pressure. PSI, again, pound per square inch, PSIG, we subtract off the atmosphere you are at and start at zero. And if you wanted to switch back to PSIA, you would add the atmosphere you're at. So that's why 14.7 is gonna be New York City, 12.1 Denver, Colorado. So in a sense, when you're reading zero on that gauge, you're actually reading in PSIA, whatever atmosphere is in your area. And then if you go less than atmosphere, so if I go back a slide here and I say that I'm in Denver, Colorado, and I have a container that I have pulled the atmosphere out and I'm down to 10 PSIA, it would actually be reading a vacuum because the pressure in the container is less than the pressure outside of the container. And that's where we're gonna call it a vacuum. And our measurements for a vacuum is gonna be inches of mercury, INHG, or in microns. Those are the two scales we're gonna to use to go ahead and check to see how far we are below atmosphere. If you guys fly on a plane sometime, take a water bottle, buy it at your store before you go on the plane. Once you get to 20,000, 30,000 feet, open the bottle up, drink a quarter, half of it up, out, put the cap back on the bottle, put it in your bag and forget about it. Then when you land on the ground, you will see that bottle has shrunk in on itself. Did you do anything? No, all you did was equalize the atmospheric pressure at 30,000 feet. And when you came down to sea level, the pressure inside the bottle is less than sea level. So it's gonna push in on its, and we call that a vacuum. Now, if you went the other way, you can sometimes see a bag of chips that they'll expand. It looks like you put air in the bag and that's what's happening. The air in the bag is less than the pressure outside and it'll cause it to expand outward. It'll cause it to expand outward. So pressure vacuum affects saturation, vaporization and condensation temperatures. Vaporization is it your evaporator evaporation where you're going ahead and adding heat to a liquid to cause it to evaporate and become a vapor. And then we take that vapor and cool it down to condense it so we can change it back into a liquid. Another example of our refrigeration cycle here, again, in blue would be our evaporator. We're taking a low pressure, low temperature vapor, excuse me, liquid, and forcing it into the evaporator. And as it's going across the evaporator, the bubbles that are in here is heat that's being added in there, causing the liquid to boil and evaporate. And as it starts to evaporate, it changes into a vapor, and then that vapor is pulled into the compressor. Now, superheat is the measurement here of what temperature is this evaporating at versus the temperature of the vapor by the time it reaches the compressor. 
The reason we need superheat is because we cannot compress a liquid. We need to have vapor in here. So we got to make sure that by the time it leaves this evaporator, we're picking up extra heat in a vapor state, and that is our superheat. Subcooling on the other side, as we push out of our compressor, we're taking and going into our condenser, lowering the temperature of the refrigerant down enough to condense it back into a liquid, and then comparing the temperature that it's condensing at to the temperature of the liquid, making sure by the time we reach this expansion valve right here, that we've got 100% liquid reaching that expansion valve. So superheat wants to make sure we have no liquid reaching the compressor and subcooling want to make sure we have 100% liquid reaching the expansion valve. We get a mixture here, it's not good. We want to make sure we're full. So that's one way of checking to see if our system has the proper charge. We don't have a gauge on there that says, oh, it's half full, it's quarter full. Using our superheat and our subcooling and looking for approximately 10 degrees of subcooling. Approximately when you have this particular device called a TXV, 10 degrees of superheat. The superheat is going to be different if you're using a non- TXV valve, where you're not controlling the superheat with the valve, you're just going to lower the pressure down. And in our classes, we explain in detail how to check more closely superheat and subcooling. And if it's off, we can use that as a diagnostics tool to find out is the problem the evaporator, is the problem the condenser, is it dirty that not enough airflow is going across there? Superheat and subcooling will be your tools to go ahead and diagnose to find out whether or not it is working properly. So the evaporator, remove heat from the condition space. The condenser, remove heat from the refrigerant. So we picked up an evaporator, we're giving it back again. The compressor to pump and pressurize the refrigerant. And the metering device, once we change it back into a liquid, we want to take that high pressure refrigerant liquid and change it back into a low pressure refrigerant liquid. And another picture of the refrigeration cycle. This is your most important thing to learn when you're starting out as a refrigeration mechanic. Those who are here today that said you're brand new to this, this is going to be tattooed in your head. You have to understand the refrigeration cycle and how it works and why it's doing what it's doing in order to be able to diagnose the system properly. So again, I always start down here in the evaporator. We start with a low pressure, low temperature liquid. We're forcing it in the evaporator and causing warm air from the condition space to blow across the evaporator. Picking up heat, causing the liquid to evaporate into a vapor. Then we measure how much extra heat we picked up as a vapor and call that our superheat to make sure we're not getting liquid back. If I have the same temperature in my evaporator that it's evaporating, the same temperature in my vapor, then I have no change. I have 100% liquid and my compressor will not like me. Now, you end up replacing that compressor. The compressor takes that vapor, compresses it to a high pressure, high temperature, and then forces it into the condenser. At this point, the temperature of the refrigerant is higher than the surrounding air. Even if it's 100 degrees outside in Arizona, they've got to get that temperature of the refrigerant to maybe 120 degrees then. So it's warmer and it's going to push the heat out of the refrigerant. And once we do that, we're condensing it back into a liquid. And so we're going to compare what are we condensing at and what temperature do we have of the liquid before we get to this metering device. And if I don't see a big enough temperature drop here, then I know that there's not enough liquid coming out and I'm getting vapor possibly going out and getting a mixture of vapor and liquid to here. And I don't want that. I don't want that. I want 100% liquid by the time it reaches that metering device. And then I start the process all over again and see it divided there, outside condition space, inside condition space, and your low side and high side, generally on drawing is gonna be drawn in as color coded in blue and in red. So here is the evaporator, follow that heat. We're gonna take that heat 
We're going to go ahead and bring it into the evaporator. Warm return air. Generally, you're talking 75 to 70 degrees temperature. Cool supply air out. We're taking and removing the heat out of the air. So when we feel it coming out of our vents, you hold your hand up there, it feels like it's cold. And that's because it's a sensible heat drop. But the refrigerant itself starts out as a liquid and then switches to a vapor. Pressure stays the same, still low pressure. And once we change to 100% vapor, we add a little bit more heat here to make sure that we have vaporized it completely, that we have 100% vapor reaching my compressor. The condenser, again, now it says cool ambient air in. What if it's a 90 degree day outside? Guess what? That is 90 degrees temperature. And then I want my refrigerant temperature to be higher than that. So in my area, we generally run our condenser refrigerant temperature about 110 degrees. It's rare for us to get above 95 degrees temperature. So it's warm enough that it's going to expel the heat out. And when you hold your hand over it, you'll feel the heat coming out of it. And we're going in as a vapor. Once we expel enough heat out of the refrigerant, it switches back into a liquid. And our subcooling is a measurement between how much heat it takes to change it, latent heat exchange, what temperature is it doing it at? 110. If my liquid temperature is 100, then that tells me I have a 10 degrees drop after I change to a liquid. And that's my subcooling. 8 to 10 is a general rule you're going to see. But always the manufacturer's specifications trumps everything. So if you look on your outdoor unit and you see subcooling says six, then you set your unit for that amount of subcooling then based on what manufacturer's recommendations are. So it's a process of following the heat. Take the heat from inside the conditioned space, absorbing it like a sponge into the evaporator, causing the refrigerant to change state from a liquid to a vapor. Then also measuring the amount of difference between what we're evaporating at and what our vapor temperature is, and that's our superheat. Taking that and raising the pressure and temperature up higher, so that way when we get to here, we wanna give off heat. We don't wanna pick up heat now. So we need the air temperature to be colder than the refrigerant, want the refrigerant temperature higher now. So it gives off the heat and we expel all the heat we picked up in the evaporator to the outside, take that liquid, reduce it down again to a low pressure liquid and start that process all over again. Moving heat from inside a conditioned space, adding it into the refrigerant and then taking it and expelling it or rejecting it outside to a place where it makes little or no difference. We don't care how warm it is outside. We just want to make sure we're comfortable inside our conditioned space. Again, superheat. Heat add to a vapor causes an increase in temperature. We are taking and heating up a liquid, causing it to evaporate. What temperature it evaporates at versus the temperature of the vapor by the time it enters the compressor, the difference in temperature, the rise in temperature is my superheat. Saturation, that would be our condensing and our evaporating. We got to a point where we put so much heat in there that it's causing it to change state. And then subcooling, again, in our condenser. When we're condensing, so comparing the saturation temperature at which we're condensing at to the temperature of the liquid by the time it reaches that metering device, how much did we lose extra out of the refrigerant? We want to make sure we have 100% vapor and in the compressor and 100% liquid entering our metering device. And that's how we're going to measure that. A good example of that is here showing us that if we had a latent heat temperature, so we're evaporating, causing it to change from a liquid to a vapor at 54 degrees temperature, then we will measure the temperature of the suction line and we see a rise up of 10 degrees, and that's the amount of superheat. Every unit is different as far as how much superheat 
are subcooling you're going to need. How do we get this 50 PSI G? Because we put a gauge on here, a blue colored gauge on our manifold gauge set and using what we call a pressure temperature chart. So we're gonna go ahead and compare Every refrigerant has a different pressure temperature relationship. So R134A, particularly at 50 PSIG of pressure, higher than atmosphere, it happens to be saturated at 54 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature it's evaporating at. Using the same R134A refrigerant for the condenser, now we're gonna use a red gauge. We're going to put a red gauge on there then using our chart we say okay the pressure inside of our condenser is 150 degrees 150 psig pardon me which corresponds on a pressure temperature chart to 112 degrees fahrenheit so what we're doing is going ahead and taking the difference between the two at this pressure the refrigerants at this temperature but then when we go on the liquid line, we're gonna use a temperature probe. The new style would be, you have a clamp. You just can physically clamp it on. The old style would have been, you had to take a temperature probe and physically tape it onto the line to get that temperature. So backing the slide up here a second, <clears throat> superheat and subcooling, very important. Superheat is a difference between what we are saturated and can changing from a liquid to a vapor and how much extra heat we added to the vapor. So comparing your evaporator temperature to your suction line, <clears throat> you're gonna wanna see a rise in temperature. If that temperature gets too close together. So instead of 54 and 64, I have 54 and 55, but the potential that liquid is gonna get back to my compressor. We've got a problem on our hands. And then subcooling. Now we're looking at the fact we're taking and condensing. We're taking that vapor and changing it to a liquid. And we want to compare at what temperatures are condensing and at what temperature are we getting a liquid feeding into the metering device. This is generally going to be the 8 to 10, 8 to 12 range. You'll hear that. But remember, look at your data plate and it'll tell you what refrigerant you have in your system. And if it's a TXV, which we're using subcooling, it'll say we require this amount of subcooling for that unit. How do we go ahead and diagnose that? This is a diagnostics tool now. So we put our blue gauge on, that would be our suction pressure. We put our red gauge on, that would be our head pressure, head pressure condenser, same thing. And we're comparing saying, okay, and on R22 system, I generally want to see my suction pressure in my evaporator to be somewhere right around 70 PSIG and in my condenser somewhere right around 225. If I see higher than that and I compare my superheat, which I normally would see 10, but now I'm only seeing a five degree rise then I could have a restricted condenser coil and also my subcooling, which normally I'd see 10 to 12, it's dropped down to maybe only two degrees difference between the condensing temperature versus the liquid line temperature. And another one is, and this is a common mistake that a lot of people find is when the evaporator is restricted, right here, restricted evaporator coil and undercharged are very similar you're gonna see low pressure on the low side, low pressure on the low side, okay? You're gonna see low pressure on the high side, low pressure on the high side. If that's all you were taught, then you automatically assume that I don't see the 70 and 225 are for 410, for those that use 410 refrigerant, you would see 120 and 400, 120 on the blue gauge, 400 on the red gauge, and you automatically assume it's low. But carefully look here. If you have an restricted evaporator coil, your superheat's going to fall. You're not putting in much as much air across the coil now, and we are pushing liquid out of the evaporator. We don't have enough heat there to evaporate all of the liquid off and boil it off. And if we continue to add more refrigerant, 
we're going to continue to lower that number down. 10, we want to be, we're going to get down to five. We might get down to one or two. And we're going to hear that compressor start to slug and start to chatter really loud. Very common mistake there. Don't just put your gauges on and assume that if you know, for our, repeat again, R22, you want to see 70 on the blue gauge, 225 on the red gauge, and you see lower pressure, it automatically means it's low on charge. There could be some other factors involved with that. And that's why we should use our superheat and our subcooling to diagnose this system. Ryan, who's my um, host today, has set up a really, really good virtual reality. So if you guys come to one of my classes for air conditioning, I put up the virtual reality and I have you guys hook up gauges and you write down what your normal pressures, your normal temperatures, superheat and subcooling, low pressure side, high pressure side, and you write down and get an idea what a normal operating system would look like. Then we click and go to scenario B, C, D, or E, and we add one of these problems. Restricted condenser coil, restricted evaporator coil, undercharged and overcharged. And what I find is most of my guys that are newer weren't trained properly, and there's no disrespect to that. That's why we offer these classes. They automatically assumed it's undercharged when they put their gauges on. And if they're wrong, and it's because you have a dirty evaporator coil, dog hair, cat hair, or your filter is clogged, no air going across there, you're going to get the same low pressure and you will be adding more refrigerant and causing liquid to slug back on your compressor. And you're going to have some major problems on your hand. So that's what this chart here is showing us. This chart is showing us using a diagnostics tool. Take your manifold gauges and use them like a doctor. If I go to the doctor and I say, doctor, I have chest pains, he's going to start checking for my heart, listening to how fast is my heart beating. He's going to listen to my lungs, breathing in and out. If you have, everyone ever had ammonia, God bless you, I had, it's trouble breathing. And that's how they diagnose and find out what's going on. That's what we're doing here. That's why superheat and subcooling are so important, but they're not taught to the proper ability they should be taught and no disrespect when you do hands-on training only. That's why classroom training and then a combination of going out and being taught by someone like me, who's a master electrician, master refrigeration mechanic, teaching you. But if I'm learning bad habits, I'm teaching you bad habits. So it's always good to start out with a class, learning the basics, dictation, then applying what you learned into the field. So it's been a pleasure having every one of you with me today. So we're going to turn this back over to Ryan. And Ryan, you can uh, entertain any questions we have. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much, Bill. We're getting a couple questions coming in uh, that I'm going to start posing to you there, Bill. And in the meantime, uh, welcoming everyone else who, who might have some curiosities based on how you've been listening in today. Uh, use the Q&A button right there and type in your question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the next 10 minutes before we close up the session. So uh, as you can see here, and just as Bill said, uh, we can only get to so much in one hour of air conditioning, right? Air conditioning is a continually learning process over the course of many years in your career. So um, we highly welcome you to continue learning. Uh, take a classroom course. For those of you who haven't taken one in over five years, lots of things have been changing. Different refrigerants are coming and going. And the EPA 608 rules for handling refrigerants are changing and altering. And you can re-up your certifications. And that's all something we're capable of helping you with at TPC. So call the number 847-808-4000. Call sales at TPC Training. Um, give them an email and we'll be able to get you set up. You might be able to even talk to me or Bill and, and hearing what you can do for your own HVAC training, including hands-on air conditioning training uh, or virtual hands-on air conditioning training, like he said. So there's a lot of options there. Um, and lastly, someone had mentioned to me, uh, are we getting a continuing education unit for this webinar in particular? The answer is unfortunately no. Uh, this is just an informational public session. So it's not up for a continuing education unit. So you're not gonna get a certificate. You're not gonna get continuing education. However, if you do want that official certificate or continuing education, we do 
uh, have that ability to potentially do that for your license uh, with our existing two day courses that you can register for. Okay, so let's get to some questions here. Um, Bill, you talked about the different elevation changes and Antoine wants to know uh, about the elevation change between Denver um, and let's say sea level. Yeah, that, that uh, if you wanna go back to that, perfect. Yep, right. um, and yep. he said, so would, would your zero point be in Denver would it be at 12.1 PSI? That would be the kind of a zero you're looking for when right. you're at... Exactly. Yeah, so go ahead. Starting out at zero, but in New York City, your starting point would be 14.696. So they've actually rounded it now and called it 14.7. But you know, depending on okay. you learn, if you look, yes. So a zero PSI gauge pressure would actually be 12.1 PSI atmospheric in, in Denver, Denver, whereas... It's, right. Whereas right. if a gauge reads zero in New York, it's actually at 14. PSI Correct. pressure. Which is why, yeah, Ryan, okay, if yeah. you take your gauges from one spot to another, it's important to recalibrate them. Otherwise, you're not getting an accurate reading. Great call out. Um, Eric wants to know about what is the scenario if we have a sub zero outside temperature? Um, let's see. So let's see if there is an outside refrigeration system, how much heat is needed to keep the low temperature, low pressure. Uh, as a vapor um, before the compressor. So in this scenario here, he's saying that the outdoor temperature has reached zero degrees temperature. So what we're gonna have is some type of control then, which is gonna slow down the amount of heat going outside. They've uh, Sometimes they'll bypass it. So they'll just go ahead and then bypass it right through the condenser. Or sometimes we'll control the fan speed of the condenser. Slow it, the more air you have blown across, the more heat transfer, the less heat, less air blown across. So I did refrigeration for about four or five years. I know exactly. And you get more service calls, I think in the winter time, believe it or not, if that condensing unit is outside because they don't have the proper ambient control there. So it's supposed to slow down the fan speed or close off part of the condenser. So you're not getting as much air across there and it, it won't work properly. It's very important to make sure we keep the system set up for one, a low side and a high side. Like for air conditioning numbers I threw out there, again, 70 on the low side, 225 on the high side for R22, and 120 and 400 for R410A. It's very important. So that'd be ambient control is what it's referring to there, right? Gotcha. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I think maybe you'd mentioned before, uh, Ashley would like to know a little bit more about a dry cooler. What's that about and how does it work? A dry cooler? Yeah, so maybe, a, maybe a filter dryer is what they might be referring to. I'm not filter sure. Filter dryer would be, so for pneumatics, you wanna take as much heat out of the air as you, or excuse me, moisture out of the air. So you're gonna run your air coming off your air compressor through a dryer and that's what it's doing. It's actually cooling the air down so you can condense the liquid out of, so you're not getting the liquid going out to your pneumatic controls. Gotcha. Uh, let's see here. Um, if our expansion valve or that TXV uh, is faulty, what would be the signs of that? What would be a symptom? Good question. One thing for the expansion valve, and that would be the TXV, and I'll bring my slide up here as I'm talking to what they're referring to is there's a bulb that's on the outside of the TXV. It's in this picture right here. So I have a TXV bulb on the outside. So right about here, I'm going to push the liquid in and I'm gonna have the TXV right here and I'm gonna have the bulb over here. If that bulb loses its charge, it's got a refrigerant charge in there, it's going to close down and it will not allow the refrigerant to go through. And in our, TPC training classes, Ryan, that last chart I showed you, I share charts which are specifically, this one's kind of more of a general, but it's specifically for TXV valves. It's just a chart specifically for troubleshooting TXV valves. And you would use your suction pressure, your superheat, your head pressure, your subcooling, and sometimes your amperage, and it will guide you in the right direction, letting you know that you're overfeeding your meter devices example that one right there Ryan. All right thank you Bill. Uh, we're getting a question from Tony um, and maybe you can just to generally reflect on uh, ammonia systems NH3. Uh, what are some lessons learned what to 
what to do's and don'ts maybe around ammonia, it, particularly maybe converting an R22 over to ammonia. Um, and anything you'd like to share about ammonia systems okay. now? Here's a short skinny on ammonia, right? <laughs> ammonia is coming back strong for large production. They're going to have ammonia outside and they're going to take water and circulate it through the ammonia. The water is going to pull the heat, going to cool the heat down. The ammonia is going to pull the heat out of the water and then send the water out to do the cooling for you. The dangerous part about ammonia is, is not only is it a refrigerant, any refrigerant will cause suffocation, ammonia is toxic. So not only will you start to choke, it'll burn your insides. Mm -mm. So very specialized training involved when you work on an ammonia system. So even with my experience, Ryan, I didn't really work with ammonia. I wouldn't go working on it until I took some more classes and some more specialized training on what the dangers are of working with ammonia. The reason, Ryan, that it's coming back is because it is deemed a global warming friendly refrigerant. In mm. the atmosphere, it's not going to do any damage. On the ground, human consumption is a problem. Does that makes that understood yeah that right it's more di a direct health impact um right but not as direct of a of a environmental Long -term environmental it's great but short term for us i mean i had a guy just recently it's funny he brought it up that was in philadelphia this week and he said about he works in an ammonia system all the ammonia is outside and they've got so much ammonia there that if there's an ammonia leak they shut down three city block wide to make the area safe because it's so toxic so it, it's you know evaporates and gets in the atmosphere yeah gotcha um and i think i can help answer this particular question on from anthony and joshua saying uh, how often do we do hands-on training on air conditioning and uh, do we have info on the classes yes joshua i'll send you an email um and anthony um weekly we are doing these hands-on trainings every week somewhere in this country in person and then also every week online if you're somewhere remote or far away from a, one of the, our class locations just log in on zoom just like you did today for the webinar and you get to connect directly to bill you'll this time you'll see him and he'll be showing you stuff in his hands and you'll be going through some virtual exercises with him virtually so whichever prefer preference you would have to do that training you can get you'll be surprised at how hands-on the training can get virtually just like bill was saying you can be hooking up gauges in a virtual environment over zoom um, and we've really uh, innovated on that so it's worth considering anthony and we'll send you more information on that as well um let's see we got one more room for one more question um and this is about uh let's see r23 refrigerant uh, for process chilling and um do we know what's going on with that phase out of that refrigerant in particular uh for process chilling and i would say regardless uh, it's always good to reference epa.gov and just look it up online to see what the latest is in terms of phase out they're pretty uh transparent about that but anything you'd like to add there bill it's, it's, it, and ryan put a good point out there here's an example i took my epa certification back in 1996. It's been a long time you don't ever have to retest again but that's a perfect example you have to be up to date on any new changes. So R23 for chillers, I can't, I don't have the information right in front of me, but you know, I'd be willing to look it up for you. If Ryan, you shoot me an email with that information. Yep. And as far as phasing out, what happened was chlorine as a refrigerant was great for us, but bad for the atmosphere. So that's why they're phasing out different refrigerants. R22 was being phased out in 2020 and the price started climbing. And as different refrigerants are phased out, the price of the refrigerant is going to start climbing up as we go along. So it's always good to take some refresher classes and try to make sure you're up to date on the new refrigerants. And I'm just going to talk, R290, Ryan, is propane. Very popular right now in small appliances, window air conditioners and if you're at a grocery, a grocery store or a, a kitchen, they might have a propane as a refrigerant. So it's very important to understand that, you know, you're not working with something you're normally used to working with. It's highly flammable. So. Absolutely. And um, really, that's about all the time we have today. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, we got a couple more questions coming in about, you know, some people asking about uh, R22 to R410A conversion, which is a big thing in the industry today. Talk to some more folks talking about propane and asking some questions there. Uh, again, uh, if you want some space and time to answer and ask those questions that you may have always had, consider taking a, a more full length official class where you can get a certificate and continuing education credit for this uh, and continuing your learning. It's never, you're never too old and too experienced to learn. So thank you so much everyone for being here on today's public webinar. Be on the lookout again for the recording and the PDF to hit our website about two to three business days and you'll get an email notification when that happens. And thank you all so much for being here. Have a great day.